scripture uh, today is Acts 2, verses 37 to 42. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the, his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tom. That was beautiful. Thank you, worship team and uh, choir. It's uh, just a, been a wonderful worship experience so far this uh, this morning. I know I look a little taller than that, which is normal. No dig against. Joe, a taller than uh, Pastor Joe is normally in the pulpit. He and his family are up in New York, as some of you may uh, know already, and uh, gotten text and pictures from their adventures in New York City, and so it's great. I know his thoughts and prayers of uh, their family are with us this morning, and I know uh, ours are with him as well. So uh, to just to, to say that also, I know he mentioned uh, probably that... Uh, he loves to preach Pentecost, and so we moved it up a week, but uh, this is really the actual day, so this is kind of Pentecost part two, so to speak, and so uh, thanks for coming and being a part of our worship service this morning. I'm reminded uh, when I saw our bulletins, as you may uh, refer to them, and look, uh, years ago when I felt the calling and my family and I went up to seminary at uh, Southeastern in Wake Forest. North Carolina. We uh, have been in Fort Myers, Florida, and we drove up there and we're getting settled in and started classes, and I felt all, you know, getting adjusted, great seminarian, you know, academic and all that, and delving deep in the scriptures, but I started to notice in the community around uh, Wake Forest that vehicles, cars, especially trucks, had this uh, sticker on the back window, this outline, and then this symbol, much like you see on your bulletin. And, and I started to think, and you know, it was in scriptures and acts. And so wow, either, either there are a number of Pentecostals in this area, I know we're in the deep Bible Belt, so either tons of Pentecostals or people that really just love Pentecost. So I just saw more and more. And so finally I got up the courage one day at a gas station. I went up to a gentleman in a truck and I said, you know, I really admire your sticker, your decal. Really tell me, you know, are you a Pentecostal or do you just love Pentecost? And he said, what? He said, neither. He said, I love to hunt deer. It's a deer back behind me. And I turned red and I was like, what? And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that was the sign of the Holy Spirit, the flames, and looked at me weird, and so I said, okay, well, obviously neither am I a deer hunter or a Pentecostal, but uh, it is a ple pleasure and a privilege, and I love the uh, honor of Pentecost when the Spirit descended and is sent out of the church, and so we'll be diving in and looking at it uh, from the scriptures uh, this morning. So let me ask a simple yet complex question. What is the church? For this is how our text ends this morning, with the creation or start of the first New Testament gathering church, otherwise known as the Apostolic Church in Jerusalem. So is the church a civic organization? Some view it this, some view it this way to better develop and enhance society and our civilization as we know it. Or is it a social club used to gather people of different backgrounds and ethnicities, typically around food, we love that, of course, as Baptists, whether it be a full meal or just dessert, to discuss the issues of our times? Is it a building, as the old rhyme goes, 
Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and see all the people, yes. Some view it that way. Webster's Dictionary defines church more as an institution that mixes in some of the previously mentioned ideas. What is most important above all of these thoughts is what God, through His Word, defines a church as, which in the original Greek is called the Ecclesia. So if you haven't already, please turn your Bibles to the book of Acts. A really quick refresher regarding Acts, and we'll start at the beginning, and I'll quickly go through the first up to where we are. It begins with a brief summary of Jesus' last days on earth with, it, with his disciples. My last sermon at the end of April, I preached on Jesus' interaction with Peter on the banks of the Sea of, the, of Tiberias. Jesus instructs, then Jesus instructs his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the, quote, gift my Father promised. Then Acts' version of the Great Commission found in Acts 1.8 reads, as we've heard, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Then his ascension right before their eyes, and the selection of a replacement for Judas Iscariot, which doesn't get a lot of attention because the true twelfth disciple would be Paul. After the ascension, the disciples were faced with an unprecedented situation, the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples in every nation had been entrusted to them, best known by the Matthew edition in 20, chapter 28, 1920. But they had received no specifications as to how they were to live together as believers or what type of structure was to contain the community. All they had been told to do was to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with supernatural power. Luke 24, 49 reads, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city till you have been clothed with power from on high. The gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost marks the true birthday of the church. Happy birthday! We should have cake and ice cream to follow the service, shouldn't we? Maybe one of these days, yes. The apostles were driven out of their hiding places to proclaim the good news of what God had done in Christ. This is what Peter is so boldly sharing here earlier in chapter 2. The first Christian church appeared in the holy city itself. It was the risen Lord who had reminded the disciples from the scriptures that repentance and forgiveness of sins were to be proclaimed in his name to all nations starting from Jerusalem. This was all in connection with the fulfillment of, the, of this promise that the apostles were ordered to wait for the bestowal of the Spirit. When the Spirit was given, the church began. Boom. Luke moves quickly to his subject, the spread of the gospel and the growth of the church. Pentecost, which we celebrated last week and continue this week, is highlighted by the filling of the Holy Spirit and then Peter's powerful sermon and where we pick up this morning. Well, let's look back in our text and walk through it. What happened nearly 2,000 years ago when Peter was addressing the crowd in Jerusalem? Peter's preaching had been effective. The people were, quote, cut to the heart. It says in verse 37 that the awful realization that in crucifying their long-awaited Messiah, they had rejected their only hope of salvation. So with deep anguish, they cried out, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter's response, true to form and his character, is direct to the point. He calls on his hearers to repent. This word implies a complete change of heart, beginning with the confession of sin. With this, he couples the call to be baptized, thus linking both repentance and baptism with the forgiveness of sins. So far, this should sound familiar, right? For John the Baptist had proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Back in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, and Jesus also made repentance central in his preaching and baptized. John chapter 3, chapters 3 and 4. So while there is much that appears traditional in Peter's exhortation, there's also much that is new and distinctive, especially in three ways to take note of. First, Peter calls on everyone, quote-unquote, of his audience to repent and be baptized. Peter calls for an individual response on the part of his hearers. 
Overseas, when I served in Bulgaria and Southeastern Europe, I used to question and ask my new friends, is your faith by choice or by birth? Set aside family and corporate relationships as having any final saving significance and stress the response of the individual person. Secondly, Peter identifies the repentance and baptism he is speaking of as being specifically Christian, that it is done in the name of Jesus Christ. What this means is that a person in repenting and being baptized calls upon the name of Jesus and thereby avows his or her intention to be committed to and identify with Jesus. Thirdly, Peter's preaching ties together the gift of the Holy Spirit to repentance and baptism. The quote, gift of the Holy Spirit is another way of describing what the disciples had experienced in, quote, the coming of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Peter's promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit is a logical outcome of repentance and baptism. This primary, primary gift includes a variety of spiritual gifts for the advancement of the gospel and the welfare of God's people. But it also has to do with what God's Spirit does for every Christian in applying and working out the benefits of Christ's redemptive work. Please don't be confused in any way to think from this passage that baptism has any role in saving you. It does not. Outward rites, such as baptism, have no true value unless true repentance and an inward change is demonstrated to accompany it. We must only go to the next chapter in Acts to see Peter's sermon in Solomon's Colonnade, where he stresses only repentance and turning to God, quote, so that your sins may be wiped out, and makes no mention of baptism. This shows for Luke at least, and probably for Peter too, while baptism with water was the expected symbol for conversion, it was not an indispensable criteria for salvation. Let me clearly state this. The early church practiced what we still make great efforts to continue to this day. That is the practice of water baptism as the external symbol by which those who believe the gospel, repent of their sins, and acknowledge Jesus as their Lord and Savior publicly, bear witness to their new life, which has been received through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Next we see in verse 39 the quote promise of which Peter speaks includes both the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Both are united in applying Christ's redemptive work to the believer. The promise, Peter declares, is not only for his immediate hearers, quote, for you, but also for succeeding generations, for your children, and for all in distant places, quote, for all who are far off. It is a promise, Peter concludes, that is sure, for it has been given by God and rests upon the prophetic word of Joel 2.32, which says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Two summary statements conclude Luke's report of Peter's Pentecost sermon. First, Peter spoke earnest, solemn words expressed by the verbs warned and pleaded in verse 40. His characterization of this age as a corrupt generation, parallels Jesus' words in Matthew 16 and 17, as well as later on when Paul uses this term in Philippians 2.15. Peter is cast into the vision of an evangelist, a vision that is all too often lost as the gospel is acclimated to the world and the world to the church. Second, as Peter, as a result of Peter's preaching, about 3,000 took the revolutionary step of baptism, Thus the congregation of believers in Jesus' name, in Jesus, came into being at Jerusalem. Originally, 120, as we saw back in chapter 1, verse 15, had gathered, and they made a huge jump by 3,000. Now that is revival and shows a supernatural church growth. Finally, we see Luke in verse 42 describing the early church by telling us that the believers in it were distinguished by their devotion to the apostles' teaching to fellowship with one another, and to the breaking of bread. What we, do to, what we today refer to as the Lord's Supper, which we will be practicing next Sunday, by the way. And finally, to prayer. A few takeaways from this last verse. The verb translated devoted implies a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action, which was 
the apostles' teaching, referring to a body of material considered authoritative because it was the message about Jesus of Nazareth proclaimed by the apostles with that first-hand account. The fellowship implies that there was something distinctive in the gatherings of the early believers. It wasn't routine. Then there is the reference to prayer. One commentator shares that there is parallelism between prayer in the life of Jesus and prayer in the life of the church. Thus I hope our corporate gatherings are bathed in prayer from start to finish. Just as Jesus modeled an intimate prayer life with the Father throughout his life from start to finish. So what are some application points from this text? First, it is not enough to be sorry for your sins. We must readily confess to God and those who may have sinned against, then let God forgive them as his word promises, and then we must live as forgiven people. Like Peter's audience, if you are convicted by the word, ask God what you should do, and then obey. Secondly, if you want to follow Christ, you must repent and be baptized. To repent simply means to turn from sin, change the direction of your life from selfishness and rebellion against God's laws. At the time, at the same time, you must turn to Christ, depending upon Him for forgiveness, mercy, guidance, and purpose. We cannot save ourselves, only God can save us. Then baptism identifies us with Christ and with the community of believers. It is a sign of discipleship and a sign of faith. Thirdly, ironically, the first Christian congregation was gathered in the very place where opposition to our Lord had been fiercest and where he was put to death as a criminal. From there, the Jerusalem church became the mother of all subsequent Christian communities. Just this week, I received a report talking about the persecution of Christians in the Middle East and North Africa. Let me share some points from this. A recent report commissioned by the British Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, highlights the extent of global persecution of Christians, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, where persecution is rising to the level of gen genocide. Hunt, an Anglican, an Anglican, has made the issue of Christian persecution one of the major themes of his foreign secretaryship, notes The Guardian, a UK publication. And may I add, our own Secretary of State, Michael Pompeo, is a born-again believer, and this is one of his priorities as well. What we have forgotten in this atmosphere of political correctness is actually the Christians that are being persecuted are some of the poorest people on the planet, said Hunt. In the Middle East, the population of Christians used to be about 20%. Now it's 5%. Here are five facts you should know from the report about persecution of Christians in the Middle East and North Africa. One, the persecution of Christians is perhaps at its most vir virulent in the region of the birthplace of Christianity. The Middle East and North Africa claims the report. The eradication of Christians on, quote, pain of the sword or other violent means is a specific and stated objective of extremists groups in Syria, Iraq, Egypt, and Northeast Nigeria. As the report adds, the level and nature of persecution is arguably coming close to meeting the international definition of genocide. Point two, the forms of persecution range from routine discrimination in education, employment, and social life, up to kidnapping, murder, and other genocidal attacks against Christian communities. The Arab-Israeli conflict has also caused the majority of Palestinian Christians to leave their homeland. The number of Palestinian Christians has been reduced in the, in the area by 87%. Third point, in some areas of the region, the state, extremist groups, families, and communities participate collectively in persecution and discriminatory behavior. In other countries, such as Iran, Algeria, and Qatar, the state is the main actor while in Syria, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Libya, and Egypt, both state and non-state actors, especially religious extremist groups, are implicated. Christians with a Muslim background are most vulnerable and face tougher persecution from all actors, especially from their families and communities. Fourthly, 
For the past few years, the most common forms of persecution have been martyrdom, violent threats, general harassment, detention, imprisonment, legal discrimination, and incitement to hatred through media and from Islamic pulpits. Confiscation of church properties and attacks on churches and properties owned by Christians is also occurring in Algeria, Egypt, Iran, and Syria. Community-based sectarian attacks on church properties have similarly increased in Egypt, Israel, and Turkey. In Turkey, Christians are depicted by the government as being a threat to the stability of the nation. The report finds that Turkish Christian civil citizens have often been stereotyped as not real Turks, but rather as Western co collaborators. Turkey's Association of Protestant Churches in their 2018 annual rights violation report claimed that anti-Christian hate speech had increased in the Turkish media, including, including <coughs> private media, which barely exists. The report states that the main impact of such genocidal acts against Christians is exodus. Christianity now faces the possibility of being wiped out in parts of the Middle East where its roots go back furthest. In Palestine, Christian numbers are below 1.5%. In Syria, the Christian population has declined from 1.7 million in 2011 to below 450,000. And in Iraq, Christian numbers have dropped from 1.5 million before 2003 to below 120,000 today. Christianity is at risk of disappearing, says the report, representing a massive setback for plurality and religious freedom in the region. So what can we do? We must pray for the universal church, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember there is no distinguishing between the persecuted church and the free church. We are one church. Amen. Let us pray.